Great. So thank you um, very much, Tracy, for the opportunity to come today. It's really a pleasure. I've been here several times over the years, and I do think that it's uh, one of you know, our favorite meetings. So I think that um, you know, it's been uh, another sort of extraordinary time in the field of oncology, and this does in large part relate to recent developments in immuno-oncology agents that are very applicable to patients who have kidney cancer. And so I'm going to talk about some of those recent clinical trial advances. And some of these are familiar to you already based on some of the other speakers' discussions. But I'll um, try to categorize these for you so that it becomes clear what sort of combinations we're actually looking at and some of the mechanisms and rationale for uh, combining different agents. And so I think you've seen this type of slide before, but I'll tell you, when I finished my training and wasn't training, there were really only two agents that were being used in patients with advanced kidney cancer. Uh, I was in New York at the time, and my mentor did a lot of work with the drug interferon, which we essentially don't use anymore in the treatment of this disease, but that was really the mainstay of therapy. And then, of course, high-dose interleukin-2. And then you can see here that there were the approval of uh, about seven drugs, right, between 2005 and, and 2012, and then subsequently uh, more agents uh, that have been demonstrated to improve outcome and survival in patients with this disease. So it, it's really been an extraordinary time uh, since my training in terms of the development of novel therapies for patients with advanced kidney cancer. So in terms of the emerging therapeutic strategies in the disease, there are several baskets. And there are more than these, but these are the main ones. Um, the first being the combination of VEGF pathway agents and PD-1 pathway inhibition. And you've heard about this uh, a little bit by Dr. Amin. Uh, and then the other one is the combination of IDO and PD-1 pathway inhibition. And he alluded to this in his last slide when he talked about the fact that there are different targets uh, on the immune cells that can potentially uh, be hit by certain drugs to combine with PD-1 pathway drugs to derive more benefit. The combination of CTLA-4 and PD-1 pathway inhibition, and I'm going to show you some slides that you've already seen already related to the Checkmate 214. And then another um, interesting approach um, targeting specifically uh, something called HIF-2-alpha. Um, which uh, previously uh, had been thought of something that was not really targetable. So one thing to notice up front is that um, when we talk about here targeting VEGF and PD-1 drugs, uh, not all of these combine safely. And so there are combined toxicities associated with uh, using certain drugs with certain agents. And here you can see that combinations, for example, of Sutent and uh, nivulumab. Uh, as well as uh, pazopinib and pembrolizumab um, were not tolerable, and uh, these have been discontinued in terms of their development. There have been other agents, um, however, that have been tolerable in combination. So, for example, the drug exitinib in combination with abilumab, uh, pembrolizumab, uh, and uh, interest looking in nivulumab, and then combinations of linvantinib and pembrolizumab, uh, cabozantinib with nivulumab, and also the drug ipilimumab, as well as bevacizumab and nivulumab. So even though these drugs work similarly, these VEGF receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors and these immuno-oncology agents work similarly, when you combine them, you see issues related to tolerability with some agents and not others. And that's, frankly, the reason why we need to do clinical trials and these clinical trials need to happen with the individual drugs, and we can't simply extrapolate from one drug to the next. So this is uh, one study uh, looking at ex exitinib and uh, avulumab. It's the Javelin, uh, which is the, uh, an acronym uh, for the name of the study, Renal 100. Uh, and this essentially looked at patients with a clear cell component. These are patients with advanced or metastatic disease. Um, no prior systemic therapy for advanced kidney cancer. And there was a dose finding period and then a dose expansion period. Um, but these drugs were essentially administered either together or in sequence. And remember, alexitinib is a VEGF receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and avulumab is what's called an anti pdl one or one of the immuno-oncology agents. And this trial demonstrated 
that um, responses um, were seen uh, in 58 percent of patients. Uh, and so this is, uh, you know, a very promising type of response rate. And disease control, which includes stable disease, was achieved in 78 percent of patients. So there's this sense that when you combine these agents, you're seeing higher response rates, potentially leading to better long-term outcomes associated with combinations as compared to using either of these drugs alone. This is looking at the time to and duration of response. Uh, these are, uh, look like swimmer's lanes. And so what you can see here is that the um, time to the development of the response is actually quite early. This is in weeks, so it occurs at about six weeks. So these are early type responses. Uh, and what's interesting is that if you look at immuno-oncology agents alone, the average time to response may be two to three months, whereas when you combine them with these VEGF receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors, you see much earlier responses, which is more consistent with the mechanism of action of those drugs. And these blue arrows represent ongoing responses, so that many of these responses uh, can be quite durable. This is looking at a water crawl plot. We, these are all the responses. We use this 30% line here, where, which we refer to as sort of the true response. Um, but you can see that all of these uh, patients, each of these uh, represents individual responses. And uh, so here, um, you can see that uh, um, 34 patients experienced tumor shrinkage of greater than or equal to 30%. And it was actually only three patients in this study that experienced tumor growth of greater than 20%. So, Again, very promising. Another study um, combining exitinib, uh, this same VEGF receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor with pembrolizumab, so now we have a different anti-PD-1 agent. Uh, and so this um, study, um, looking at overall response rate here, um, the objective resp response rate was 71%. Um, so once again, uh, much higher type response rates than we appreciate with immuno-oncology agents alone or with these VEGF receptor tyrosine kinase uh, agents alone. And you can see uh, there are complete responses here, 5.8% and partial responses in the majority of patients, as well as patients achieving stable disease. And this is just, again, a similar type of plot. These are individual patients, and you can see here that uh, um, the response rate, uh, again, being 71%, and very few patients actually had any evidence of progression of disease, um, only really one patient. So moving on to other potential targets in combination with immuno-oncology agents, and this was mentioned by Dr. Amin in his talk, and this is one that is sort of further on in development. It's a drug called uh, epicatastat, and epicatastat uh, is a drug that targets uh, an enzyme called ID01. And so this is a, a bit complicated, but um, tryptophan is an amino acid, and uh, what happens is that IDO1 is responsible for the metabolism or the breakdown of um, tryptophan, which is involved in a pathway called the kynurenine pathway. And you can see that um, with higher IDO levels, you see less tryptophan and in increased kynurenine. And what this actually does is it creates a more immunosuppressive environment um, so that the tumor is able to evade the immune response. Uh, so that drugs now have been developed targeting this IDO1. And by targeting IDO1, you're unable to break down the tryptophan, you don't have the higher kynurenine, and you, trans you go from an immunosuppressive environment um, where the tumor can evade the immune response to one in which the tumor um, is now uh, open to immune attack by the T cells. And so this in combination with one of the anti-PD-1 or PDL one agents is uh, mechanistically something that has a lot of rationale. And so uh, there uh, is, a ha is a trial that's been done. This is the ECHO-202 uh, Keynote 037 study. And this is a study that includes a cohort of patients with kidney cancer. And based on the mechanistic rationale, uh, this study was done. Um, it combined it with pembrolizumab, an anti-PD-1 agent, and demonstrated response rates uh, in 33% of patients, and higher response rates in patients that received only zero to one prior lines of therapy, so here 47%. And so again, here are those, um, those, those graphs again, um, individual patients, and it's just demonstrating the response rates. 
This is looking in patients based on the biomarker PDL1 in the tumor. So you stain the tumor to see if there is high or low expression of this PDL1. But you can see that responses were seen regardless of whether you had higher or lower or present or absent PDL1 expression. Uh, looking at the uh, duration of response, once again, uh, here you can see that the responses are quite early, occurring uh, on the order of about nine weeks, and that based on these green arrows, that many of these responses continue uh, to occur, so that these um, responses are ongoing. And this whole idea of ongoing responses or durability of responses is really consistent with what has been so exciting about the use of immuno-oncology drugs. And what also is exciting about this combination is that it's actually well tolerated. So one of the concerns is that if you take two immuno-oncology agents and you deliver them to a patient, you're going to see more in the way of immune-related adverse events. So what you're doing is you're essentially ramping up the immune system to attack the tumor. Unfortunately, one of the effects of that is that you ramp up the immune system and the immune system then uh, mistakenly attacks organs within the body and can cause inflammation in the lungs and the liver and the thyroid and other places. But what we've seen here is that there really wasn't an excess in the way of immune-related adverse events or significant toxicity, so that this was actually quite tolerable. So um, excitement with a new agent, uh, 30 patients, uh, good response rate. Um, the response rate with nivolumab alone, as an example, is 25%. So it looks like we are doing something different here by adding this agent. Um, and then from a toxicity tolerability profile, um, this uh, appears to be well tolerated uh, in, a, you know, again, a relatively limited experience. And so there is a phase three uh, study of this combination that is not quite open yet of uh, sunitinib, which is sutant or pazopinib botriant um, uh, in the uh, first line setting versus the combination of epicatastat and pembrolizumab. And then you've seen a lot of these slides already, so I'm not going to show uh, all of them, but uh, this demonstrates the combination of anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1, PDL one therapy. And so this, uh, again, uh, combinations of immuno-oncology agents, this has already been sort of done in the field of melanoma and has demonstrated a lot of promise, although with increased toxicity. One of the nice things in kidney cancer is that the doses that were used in this study are actually different than the doses that were used in metastatic melanoma. And so that has led to less in the way of some of the toxicities that were seen in the melanoma studies. And so this was the Checkmate 214 study comparing sunitinib or sutin to ipilimumab uh, and nivulimab. And um, I'm not going to go through this because you've already seen many of these slides, but uh, it looked in an intermediate and poor risk population. Uh, and um, basically, uh, what it did show here is that um, the uh, response rates were higher with the combination of Nevo and Ipilimumab as compared to Sutent. Um, there was an improvement in uh, progression-free survival with the combination as compared to Sutent. Um, there was an improvement in overall survival, again, in this intermediate and poor risk population. Um, and I'm just going to summarize this uh, as follows, that among the intermediate and poor risk patients, there was a survival benefit with the combination of nivulumab and ipi, an improvement in response rate, an improvement in progression-free survival. When they looked at all of the patients that included favorable risk patients too, there was an overall survival benefit and an improved overall response rate. Among patients with PDL1 greater than 1% expression within the tumor, there was a higher overall response rate um, and a higher progression-free survival. But again, as Dr. Amin had mentioned and others, among favorable risk patients, SUTENT was associated with a higher overall response rate and an improvement in progression-free survival. So it looks like, at least for the intermediate poor risk patients, um, by criteria that um, uh, Dr. Wing mentioned, uh, the nivulumab uh, ipilimumab combination makes sense, but in patients with favorable risk disease, sudenitinib uh, would still remain the treatment of choice. This just sort of outlines the response rates in the frontline metastatic RCC setting, and I think that uh, it becomes quite clear very quickly that um, the field is really advancing rapidly. I mean, this is 2016, 2017 data here. 
Um, and you can see here the incredible promise in terms of response rates. And remember, these response rates often translate to durability of those responses. And larger trials will ultimately tell us whether or not there's survival benefits associated with these combinations. And then finally, agents to watch. Um, so uh, this is uh, a, a novel target. It's called uh, HIF2 uh, Alpha. Uh, and in fact, we have Billy Kim uh, is sitting in the audience, who's one of our translational researchers, uh, and actually did some of really the seminal work in this area um, when he was at Harvard uh, with Dr. Kalin um, in identifying this sort of as a mechanism in kidney cancer. Uh, and so here, um, what we know is that HIF2 alpha is what's called the transcription factor. And we've heard of this gene, I think Mary probably mentioned this earlier, von Hippel-Lindau or VHL. And under normal conditions, this VHL uh, binds uh, to HIF2 alpha. And what happens under those circumstances is that when VHL is normal and there's no problem, uh, this ultimately uh, gets sent to sort of the garbage can of the cell, which we refer to as the proteasome for degradation, and it gets broken down and sort of tossed out. Um, but what happens um, in situations where VHL uh, is sort of knocked out, where it is in kidney cancer, is that the VHL cannot bind to the HIF2 alpha. And so what happens is the HIF2 alpha goes into the nucleus of the cell, and it partners with its friend HIF2 beta, and then uh, it uh, essentially translocates to the nucleus, and it leads to the development and um, of multiple, a, uh, multiple proteins that are involved in, uh, in the progression of kidney cancer, things like VEGF and, uh, and PGGF and, and erythropoietin and others that ultimately drive the cancer. And so it makes sense that this HIF2-alpha could be a really interesting target. And in fact, there's a drug, P2977, uh, which binds to and blocks the function of HIF2-alpha. Uh, and, um, and in so doing, uh, what it essentially does is where we are right now is we are in a time when we are targeting these sort of uh, uh, mediators of, of, of the cancer, like VEGF. But this um, agent uh, targets it much earlier on. So you can see it targets it um, downstream of all of, these other, um, other, all of these other proteins that we're able to target now with these drugs. And so um, I think people are very excited about the ability to finally target um, HIF2-alpha, which is something, again, uh, was felt to be uh, uh, something that was not potentially targetable in the past. And so a lot of excitement uh, in kidney cancer, combinations of VEGF and PD-1 pathway inhibitors, really, really very promising. Combination of epicatastat, the IDO inhibitors, as well as others in these immuno-oncology agents. Combinations of CTLA-4 and PD-1 pathway inhibition with the Checkmate 214 study demonstrating a survival benefit in the first-line setting that most certainly is going to uh, come down the pike quickly and uh, uh, be approved for the management of patients with advanced disease. And then um, the excitement surrounding the ability to target novel, uh, uh, novel um, proteins uh, that uh, potentially uh, may help uh, to um, either alone or in combination uh, continue to advance uh, the treatment of patients with this disease. And so with that, um, I'll stop, and I'm more than happy to take uh, any questions uh, if anyone has. Yes. Right, so it's really an excellent question. Um, so progression-free survival um, probably is not the best endpoint for a bunch of these different studies. So remember Dr. George was talking about disease-free survival as being a reasonable endpoint in adjuvant studies. Um, progression-free survival may not be the best endpoint in some of the immuno-oncology studies just by virtue of the fact that what you see in these studies is you see responses that are associated with durability but those responses are not, at least to date, occurring in the great majority of patients. So it may not ultimately translate at this very moment with all of these agents or combinations to an improvement in progression-free survival, but there may ultimately be an improvement in survival in those patients who achieve those responses. And so the hope is that if we can drive the response rates up, which we know are associated with durability, 
then we may ultimately lead to improvements in overall survival and in all likelihood progression-free survival as well. So it shouldn't be discouraged by that. I think that, you know, we're still sort of, you know, early in some of those studies in terms of being able to look at some of these endpoints. Great. Well, thank you so much.